This is chapter 10, first video. Now in chapter 10, we deal with two populations. Like in chapter 8 and chapter 9, we looked at one population. In chapter 8, it was one population confidence interval. In chapter 9, is one population hypothesis testing. That is, one, by one population, I mean one mu confidence interval for mu or hypothesis testing for mu the population mean now in chapter 10 we deal with two populations and therefore we have two population means so here we see some notations this is the first population with the mean mu sub 1 the subscript 1 indicates population 1 and then the standard deviation of population 1 is denoted by sigma sub 1 and similarly, we have mu sub 2 for the mean of the population 2 and sigma sub 2 is the standard deviation of population 2. So obviously, we will not have the value or we won't know the values of mu sub 1, mu sub 2 or sigma sub 1 or sigma sub 2 and our task is to estimate the values for mu sub 1 and mu sub 2. Now, in the course of estimation, uh, we have to take random samples. So one from population 1 and another one from population 2. So here is sample 1 taken from population 1. Okay, This must be a random sample. And independent of this random sample, we take another sample from population 2 and we call that sample 2. So the sample statistics are we take a sample of size n sub 1 and from that we compute the average of the sample which is x bar sub 1 and we compute standard deviation from that sample which is s sub 1. We do the same thing for the second population so we have n sub 2, x bar sub 2 and s sub 2 and these three are for the these are for from the second population. Now we need to now estimate mu sub 1 and mu sub 2 and we can use x bar sub 1 as a point estimate for mu sub 1 and x bar sub 2 as a point estimate for mu sub 2. And we want to now develop a confidence interval for the difference in the means between the two populations. Okay, so that is the parameter of interest for us. So in the first section in chapter 10, we could assume that sigma sub 1 and sigma sub 2 are known. So if the population standard deviations are known, the means are the ones that we don't know. Okay, so the parameter of interest is mu sub 1 minus mu sub 2. Assuming that sigma sub 1 and sigma sub 2 are known, then we know that we can estimate the difference in mu sub 1 and mu sub 2 is x bar sub 1 and x bar sub 2. Okay. That is the point estimate from the sample means that we have calculated. So we estimate that that is going to be our estimate for the difference in the population means. Obviously there is going to be a certain amount of statistical error between what we think the difference is between the population means and what the actual population mean difference is going to be. And that's something that we need to calculate or, or place a limit on the margin of error and for that we need to understand that the expected value of this difference x bar sub 1 minus x bar sub 2 is the difference in the actual population means and the standard deviation for that point estimate of x bar sub 1 minus x bar sub 2 and we call that standard error is given by this formula okay. and since we are assuming that sigma sub 1 and sigma sub 2 values are known then we can calculate what the standard error is going to be and based on this information then we can develop a confidence interval for the difference in mu sub 1 and mu sub 2 and for that we have to assume that the samples that we have taken n sub 1 and n sub 2 or large okay and by large uh, we can use the thumb rule that the sample sizes are both 
greater than or equal to 30. If that is so, then we can assume that the difference in the point estimates will follow an approximately normal distribution. Then the confidence interval is given by the point estimate x power sub 1 minus x power sub 2 plus or minus the z value from the normal distribution table for a given confidence level. For example, if it is 95 percent or 99 percent confidence level, using that we will look up the z value from the table and multiply by the standard error. So this part is the margin of error and this is the point estimate. And from these two then we get the lower limit and the upper limit for the confidence interval. Now similarly we can do a hypothesis testing and again we have three possible types for the hypothesis testing for mu sub 1 minus mu sub 2. So here are the two one tail tests and this is the two tail test. So it can be set up in one of these three types only. We can set up the test statistic as z calc with this formula and then compute the p value and based on the p value we can make a conclusion. Now of course all of this will work only if sigma sub 1 and sigma sub 2 are known. But that is rarely, if ever, the case. So if sigma sub 1 and sigma sub 2 are not known, then we have to estimate sigma sub 1 and sigma sub 2 with S sub 1 and S sub 2 and replace sigmas with the sample standard deviations. When we do that, we can no longer use Z distribution. So that We will discuss that in the next section. A chapter 10 second video in the previous video I gave an introduction to chapter 10 so we have two populations the first population mean mu sub 1 standard deviation Sigma sub 1 second population mu sub 2 for mean and Sigma sub 2 for standard deviations so we take two independent random samples the first sample from the first population n sub 1 sample size x bar sub 1 is the sample mean s sub 1 is the sample standard deviation sample 2 from population 2 n sub 2 is the sample size x bar sub 2 is the sample mean and s sub 2 is the sample standard deviation in the previous video we looked at the case when sigma sub 1 and sigma sub 2 are known the second section where sigma sub 1 and sigma sub 2 are unknown, which is the more practical situation. Yes. Sigma sub 1 and sigma sub 2 will rarely, if ever, be known. Okay. If the two standard deviations are unknown, then there are two cases. One is sigma sub 1 and sigma sub 2 are not equal. So if this is your first case. Sigma sub 1 is not equal to sigma sub 2. So we are still interested in the parameter mu sub 1 minus mu sub 2 and the point estimate is x bar sub 1 minus x bar sub 2. The expected value of x bar sub 1 minus x bar sub 2 is still mu sub 1 minus mu sub 2. Now this was the standard deviation or standard error of x bar sub 1 x bar sub 2 if sigma sub 1 and sigma sub 2, sigma sub 2 are known. Obviously we do not know those, those values. So we have to estimate. So we replace wherever we have sigma sub 1, we replace it by S sub 1. Sigma sub 2, we replace by S sub 2. And when we do that, then we have to come up with the degrees of freedom. And there is a formula for that degrees of freedom in page 416. It's kind of complicated formula. We don't have to worry about that because we're going to generate this information from Excel. So once we estimate the standard error in this fashion, then we can substitute this in our confidence interval formula. Of course, for us to be able to do that, we need to make sure that the sample sizes are large enough for us to be able to assume normal distribution. That is, both samples must be greater than or equal to 30. Then the confidence interval formula looks exactly same with two differences 
from the previous one. One is we use t distribution since we don't know the value of sigma sub 1 and sigma sub 2. We have to use t instead and, and, and we use this standard error instead of that one. So this gives us the confidence interval and a similar change should be instituted for, for hypothesis testing. Of course, this degrees of freedom will have to come from this formula which is really complicated formula. Okay, so hypothesis testing, same three types of hypothesis and we use the T formula and again it looks very similar, the only difference being the denominator instead of sigma sub 1 we use S sub 1, instead of sigma sub 2 we use S sub 2. If we have this on the p-value then we can come up with a conclusion and interpretation for the hypothesis. Okay. 